Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the 5 p.m. session of Art Basel Salons. Um, my name is Einar Engström. I am deputy editor-in-chief of Leap Magazine, based in Beijing. Uh, together with me, we have Chao Chun Fai from Hong Kong. He is an artist. We have Pauline Yao from M Plus, curator at M Plus Museum of Visual Culture. Uh, Xu Tan, uh, also an artist from Guangzhou. Uh, and Anthony Young, a researcher at Asia Art Archive. Thank you all for being here. And thank you all for being here. So, um, this, this panel is called The Gift of Tongues. And um, initially, we were set to discuss uh, how art is presented in different languages. In other words, how we discuss art. Is it different when we talk about art in Chinese as opposed to when we talk about art in English? Um, later, we decided against that because we uh, had better people or more appropriate people to talk about uh, how they use language in their art. So um, the term gift of tongues actually is from the Bible. I've never read the Bible, so it's really dangerous to do this. <laughs> but I've read this part, and um, I can give you a minute to read, or I can read it for you. How's that? It's from Acts in Corinthians. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, just as you determine, you can interpret that as you like. Um, my initial inspiration for using this term, the gift of tongues, was in 10, we see part A. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues and to still another interpretation of tongues. So uh, in my twisted mind, the artist is speaking in the tongues. He is using a language uh, that was bestowed upon him by the spirit. So uh, in the Bible, we actually were talking about, uh, uh, or currently the gift of tongues is, is meant to refer to uh, uh, speaking in a language you actually haven't learned. Most of our artists have learned. Uh, they've studied either art or, or maybe it's come to them naturally. But this was a, a, a tongue-in-cheek way of referring to art as a gift, something, a power that we other non-artists do not have. Um, Regardless, uh, let's move to the next one. So the idea was actually that uh, <clears throat> instead of talking about art as a language, we're now talking about uh, language within art. And the artists we have here today um, Shutan and Anthony, uh, Shutan and Chao Chunfai are both uh, renowned for using language in their artworks in different ways. Um, and we'll get to how they've done that in a minute. But first I want to go over really quickly uh, how language has been used in art within art history. Um, and what we're looking at first here is uh, the founder of the Futurist Movement, the Italian uh, visionary Marinetti and his work Vive la France. Um, and here you'll see that he has taken language and turned it into a visual object. Um, and he's also working with typography and numbers and a, and, and a different number of things. But he was one of the first people, uh, and this is considered a uh, founding work of modernism, to actually take language and, uh, and turn it into something other than just words, let's put it like that. Uh, a more famous, 
I think, uh, among those familiar with literature like me, is Apollinaire, who uh, I think you can both recognize what's on the left there. And the right is obviously uh, a figurative work. It's a female in a hat. Um, but regardless, this is uh, uh, a trend that uh, began with Marinetti and continued all the way up through the mi middle of the 20th century with concrete, the concrete poets in Brazil and Latin America. Um, but before that, we had Duchamp, who uh, in his disc series would actually, he printed words, uh, they were often quips or jokes, puns he calls them, uh, on iron discs and then would spin them. So from the language of representation to uh, visual effect, he did this uh, whole series. And a lot of these works you're seeing were um, shown in a wonderful exhibition at MoMA in New York in 2012 called Ecstatic Alphabets. Um, and if you're interested in this conversation after, you can go and look that up. Um, there's a lot more art to be looked at there. Uh, later in the 70s, after the Concrete Poets, uh, uh, with, with uh, the artist Bruce Nauman, I think most of you know, I think this is one of the first neon sign works. Uh, it's called Raw War. So depending on how you look at it, we have war and raw in the same artwork. Um, he was decided to trend among artists with the neon thing, but the language is the core of that. And then back into the local context, we have Xu Bing, um, which uh, we'll talk about more later with Pauline, uh, who would invent his own languages um, or utilize other languages com in combination with uh, in, together in combination to create new constructed languages. This is actually all English you're seeing here. Um, Baba, black sheep, have you any wool, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's a whole song right there, actually, or poem. And then down here, uh, although we're, we're not looking at, uh, at the time he wasn't considered an artist, but now he is very much so, uh, the king of Kowloon, who uh, would uh, reclaim his territory as a descendant of uh, the, as an imperial, how would you call it? Hmm? Who, who would tell stories on the city of Hong Kong in only a linguistic manner, uh, obviously by graffiti. Okay, very quickly. So that's just a few artworks that, um, that uh, used language as a medium. And we're gonna talk about later what that means uh, with Pauline as opposed to other forms of language within art. So uh, first of all, we have two artists here. They're fantastic artists, um, and you'll soon see why. And I'm just going to show a few images, first of Chao Chun Fai's work, um, and ask him to explain what's going on. So this is a series of paintings that you created um, based on movies, Hong Kong movies, I think all of them. Yes. Now, what some of you are going to see here uh, is a painting. Um, I see the subtitles, at least first. As, as a spectator, um, for whatever reason, I'm not looking at a painting. I'm looking at a situation constructed by language. And that's, 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 that's my interpretation of the gift you've given me, is the language, not the painting. The painting is secondary, um, but for some people, Maybe the subtitles are secondary, the language there is secondary. Can you tell me, first of all, why you began painting these? Why did you not leave it at just the picture plane, just the picture, just the canvas? Why did you have to add the uh, subtitles? Some of my artist friends just tell me that um, I don't have to paint. I just do the capture from, uh, from, uh, from a DVD and then that's it. But uh, <laughs> for me, I think what we are doing now is not just pure or fine arts. That um, I, 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 we are not doing something in the, like uh, modern art do. Like uh, it doesn't have to be neat and tidy anymore. So in a, in just one piece of work, there can it can there can be many interpretation. 
uh, or, or uh, ways of interpretation. So some artists or some, some of the audience will, will see the painting, or, but uh, some of the audience will see it as the uh, uh, subtitles. But for me, it's, um, the most important uh, element is to um, jump between media. I mean, uh, the, obviously it is from a local movie, and mm. um, the local movie uh, it, it's telling about a story in Shanghai in 1920 to, to 30. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, the story in, in Shanghai reflects the uh, situation in Hong Kong. Too. So when I do um, frozen steel from a movie, um, I didn't change anything. That if I change the subtitle, I, was, I change the wordings from the movie, then I think it's too easy. Or I would say the chemistry will just disappear if I change it. Mm -hmm. So the subtitle is exactly the same from the movie. While you know the, the, all these gangsters, they, are, they, are, they were gambling in Shanghai, and at that period of time, it, will, they are, it, it was the colony of different countries in, in Shanghai. So, and that's what they tell in the, in, in, at the table. And uh, when I have this frozen still um, in a show today, then uh, it means something else. Like um, uh, someone asks, uh, which China do you mean? Mm. Or uh, who, who is ruling China in, in, in a way? Mm -hmm. or, uh, and, Depends and, on the listener. And Absolutely. especially for this painting, I... I show it in Hong Kong and also in uh, Saatchi, in, in the show of uh, Hong Kong art. Mm -hmm. Hong, Hong, Hong Kong in, in art. London. In London. So it is um, also uh, a way that uh, I'm a Hong Kong artist. I'm showing in Britain. And um, I put this, uh, such, such a subtitle in, in a show in, in Saatchi. So that's also about the situation, that the, the, uh, where should I put it, uh, this painting to? Is, it, is this a, 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 a sort of a critique of your own situation, representing uh, Hong Kong in the country that used to, to, be our, to control Hong uh, Kong? Yeah. Or yes. w these works were not created specifically for that show, right? It was. It the, was. The, the, the first, uh, I first showed it in, in Saatchi, so it was. Can you explain the context behind this? Um, in the Chinese, at least, we see Fan Zheng. The first two words, so anyway, and in the end of the English, I guess I see now as well. Yeah, but you, uh, there, there, there's an English trans translation. Um, but the, it's always funny to read both the English and uh, Chinese subtitle, that, uh, especially for, for local movies. Sometimes, so, sometimes it, it makes no sense to, when you uh, can read both. Uh, but of course, for, for this one, I think it's uh, well, it's uh, so so. It's okay to to to, to have the translation like this. Uh, but uh, my first painting of this series is really because of the uh, translation. But uh, I I think well, maybe it, it will be shown later. And for this one, it's, it is uh, from the movie Inferno Affairs. Uh, Very famous Hong uh, yeah, Kong film. Yeah, Moganto. That. Um, um, of course, it's uh, a story about an undercover that he, he, uh, Tong Li Leung don't have, doesn't have a clear identity about if, if he, he is a cop or if he is a mafia. So, um, and there are many critics about um, the Hong Kong movies too, that um, why undercover is a, such a famous or such a common um, Topics for for Hong Kong movie maybe it's because of the uncertain identity of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So when I have such a subtitle with the uh, scenery, which is uh, the Victoria Harbour, so it means not only about the the, under, uh, the identity identity of uh, the undercover, but also the identity identity of uh, Hong Kong uh, uh, people. And without without the language here, the painting would be almost meaningless. Uh, depending on the viewer's subjectivity. Sure. Ha whether or not the viewer had seen the film, correct? Yes. And uh, I intended to have um, paintings from movies which, is, which are remakes. I mean, um, the movie is, uh, was from a novel. So like this one is from uh, uh, 
Hong Wei Gui, Bao Wei Gui, Red Rose, Red Rose, which is written by Yiling Zhang, Zhang Oiling. Um, the subtitle is exactly the same from the movie and also from the novel. Um, of course, the, the, in the original novel, it, uh, the freedom uh, Zhang Aining mentioned is about the freedom of um, maybe for, for a female, that uh, she doesn't have the freedom for the, her marriage because of, uh, of the uh, Chinese traditional and also uh -huh. for the, for the in, a, in a, such a big family, in Chinese family that uh, we, they don't have privacy. So that's the freedom uh, Zhang meant in the, no in the novel. But uh, when I recapture such a subtitle in, in uh, today, then the freedom we, we mentioned is, is well, I, I think immediately we, we would think of something political. Even though the, the uh, we can speak e everywhere, it is st still true in the, mm -hmm. In both situations, still absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is the um, a Bruce Lee movie, which was which was made in uh, in the seventies. But uh, when you see the subtitle, and maybe you, you recall what Liu Xiaobo said. Uh, it was, I think it was just a coincidence. I don't, I'm not sure if Liu Xiaobo watched Bruce Lee before. But, um, I think he probably did. He did? <laughs> yeah, I think, okay. I think he probably did. So, uh, so Liu Xiaobo d did the same work as I did. So, yeah, when I, have, when I uh, watched the movie and then find the subtitle, I, I, uh, uh, immediately I, I recall what Liu Xiaobo said. And... Uh, of course, for Bruce Lee, he's tell, he was telling something about the martial, martial art. Yeah. That, um, the, it's not the enemy, but uh, it's about yourself, and also uh, it's about the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, when I read such a subtitle, it's, uh, I, I recall the whole um, political situation. Uh, where, that, that is what we are facing. So I uh, intended to have this painting with me uh, when I, uh, if, I don't know if, uh, if you know that uh, I ran the election in 2012 in the Legislative Council in Hong Kong. Yeah. So when I uh, submit my form, I brought this painting with me in the council. You brought this painting to the council. Yeah. Uh, just to make clear, I don't know if everybody knows, and um, Chow actually ran for a political office in Hong Kong uh, two years ago? Two years ago. Two years ago. So that's a new direction in his artwork and also in some ways language based. Um, well we can maybe actually Pauline, do you have any thoughts on how that how language comes into a work like that? Which is in other words, conceptual performance like in uh, mm. besides the physical act of walking into the the office and applying, you know, the whole thing is based in, in these language games. Yeah, but uh, at the same time, I ran the election very seriously. <laughs> so, um, um, but no, no, I don't have uh, I don't have a particular comments about, about okay, that. Well I guess I I never thought about it in that way. But it is an interesting way to to, to frame it. I didn't I didn't think about that way. Okay. Maybe, but I, maybe maybe other people don't know so much about how it would be read that way. I don't know if that's uh, something. Maybe if I can elaborate a little bit, how you saw. So maybe brought this into the into yeah, the, but uh, maybe I should just put it simple. That uh, when I ran the election, I didn't see anyone as my enemy. But uh, I'm just trying to claim the cultural right for the public, and um, I try to uh, just uh, ring, the, uh, ring the alarm about the, the uh, political political situation, and also the the, um, the the rule of game is not fair. So so I'm not seeing anybody even uh, for for the other candidate. They are not my enemy. So that's mm -hmm. why I have such a pain with me uh, during the uh, election. Um, in in the uh, in the in the middle of the 20th century, when we had um, the poesia concreta, the concrete poetry, um, one of their main goals was to uh, use language visually and remove all metaphor from it. Um, and this is you've gone backwards and you brought metaphor back in into this, right? Into the with language, you brought metaphor into your other artwork. 
Okay. Um, I, I've brought two performance pieces by Chow here. Um, and I just saw this for the first time last week. Um, what's the name of this? The Art of Painting. Yes. Reproducing the Art of Painting. Um, could you tell us what's going on here? Um, maybe showing the video is much, clear, uh, much easier, but um, because of the uh, limit of time, so I just uh, try to put it uh, in this way. That, uh, um, it was a reproduction of uh, a painting by Vermeer, which is called The Art of Painting, mm -hmm. that uh, I pose as the muse in, inside the painting. And um, when I was having a show in the gallery, I tried to have another performance about the work that um, I dress again uh, like the, the muse inside the painting. And then I try to use touch to introduce who is Vermeer and what is, what is the meaning of, of that painting. But you're of course, I, I didn't speak Dutch. You're reading, you're reading this in Dutch. So What's the I, document, the uh, text? I, I wrote something about Vermeer in, uh, in English, and I tried to ask my Dutch friend to translate for me because Vermeer uh, is a Dutch. Uh, four years, uh, 400 years ago. So um, I asked him to translate for me, and I asked him to uh, just speak, uh, say, say it one, one time for me, and uh, I tried to write down all the pronunciation in Cantonese. So it, it is a uh, phonetic uh, uh, translation so from Dutch to Cantonese. So when I was uh, doing the whole performance, I tried to read all the Chinese in Cantonese. Oh, and of course, if you can read Chinese here, then it means nothing. It just sounds like Dutch. So uh, throughout the whole performance, even though there are English speaking uh, and Chinese speaking and also Dutch speaking audience in the show, but uh, none of them understood what I said. And I think that that is what I'm trying to do too, that um, I, I, I'm doing translation, I would say, that I, tr I translate works from uh, Renaissance or cl uh, 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 any cl classical masterpieces into contemporary so-called languages. Or I translate uh, from different culture. Um, You've in, but you're intentionally failing, in a sense. Uh, you're yes, destroying uh, the language. There must be something lost in the translation. Even like uh, when I pretend to be a Vermeer, then, but uh, I, for sure I don't, I don't look like Vermeer. Right. Uh, so there must be uh, many things lost in, in the translation. But uh, I would say, uh, I would see this kind of loss as uh, a creation of a new language. So uh, when you read all the Chinese here, uh, it means nothing, but um, it is uh, just a, uh, some kind of language I, I translated from uh, Dutch. And this is another performance I did. Um, uh, because I, when I was in art school, I, I, we both studied Chinese and West, so-called Western art. So I'm quite good at uh, all those calligraphy and uh, brush and ink paintings too. And um, we also have this kind of situation that we, we learn this. Uh, sometimes we have to learn Chinese art history in English. But for me, it is really hard. I mean, uh, even in high school, not only for, for art history, even I was in high school, I studied modern Chinese history, all those uh, like uh, cultural revolution in English, right. uh, which is really a headache. Where was this again? It was in... Here in Hong Kong? In, in Hong Kong, yeah. So um, I just try to have this situation in, 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 in such a performance that uh, I call this fight can white, fight fight came white <laughs> because it, it, it is uh, from from the TV program if you know it's Yen Ken Kok that uh, Yan Man Da uh, Yan Man Da right yeah that he 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 he, teach, he teaches uh, uh, Chinese cooking uh, in a very Cantonese yeah, English yeah this is I, I really recommend that everybody goes uh, to YouTube and looks for this to look for this video because it's probably it was the funniest thing I've seen in as long as I can remember. This is the maybe the funniest one of the funniest artworks that I've ever seen, and it, that's interesting because precisely comedy is an effective vehicle for transmitting any message, right? 
Um, and you can't do most comedy without language. And so, again, you're speaking in English, teaching calligraphy, and then what happens? And then the, uh, the final result is I wrote the uh, calligraphy uh, about internet internationalization. So it's a, it's a process of inter internationalization that uh, we are using English to teach Chinese calligraphy. So throughout the whole process, I introduced all the tools, all the, all the brushes and ink uh, in a very broken uh, translation or, uh, and also in a very Cantonese, Hong Kong Cantonese uh, essence of English. So, yeah. Um, this reminds me of something that Pauline mentioned yesterday because uh, we're looking at, uh, at verbal representation we're also looking at a physical material, um, and I'm not quite sure what you meant yesterday when you said there's a difference between language as a medium and language as a material. Hmm. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure even how I would describe that either. I think that I brought that up as um, because because I remember when we talked about this uh, panel, you had mentioned at one point that uh, you were thinking about making you know one part of the discussion being around. Uh, you know, language as a medium. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it just got me thinking, what, what is the difference and is there a difference between thinking of language as a medium versus thinking of it as a material? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe if we think of language as a material um, in the context of, of, of art, uh, maybe, maybe language as a, as a medium is something I'm associating more with like a kind of conceptual art practice mm. in which uh, things are conveyed through the main language is used to right. then uh, convey a set of ideas. And then uh, one could say, that's why it's always sort of been said that certain forms of uh, conceptual art, um, or I mean, I'm talking about a sort of conceptualism happening in the 60s maybe, uh, in which you know there would maybe not be um, a, a sort of dematerialized, right? Like there was no material, it's just the language. It's just conveying that idea and one can just imagine based on a statement or something like that. Um, but it's always, always, um, I think, also been apparent that that sort of notion of uh, dematerialized art is also a myth. I mean, there's have something very material there, even in uh, some of the those uh, so-called sort of ephemeral um, practices. They often did require a certain set of physical objects to mm. convey that. Mm. Uh, so it made, yeah, just I guess it started to, to make me think about um, material and how in, you know, in, in, in art uh, practices or, you know, traditionally we're thinking of materials like, like wood or stone or, or metal or plaster or something as like being, being uh, sculpted or uh, transformed and being, uh, you know, sort of forged, something that might use someone's um, hands maybe, but, mm -hmm. uh, but that in some cases, certainly with some artists, language is the thing that they're they are uh, transforming, or that mm. they are like uh, sort of molding and shaping, uh, and that you know language. I mean, in that could, one could say that as the context of when I brought up Xu Bing as uh, an artist who's, um, you know, you, you could say the, sure the material is also woodblock and, and printing and, and sure. all that. That that's sort of from the protocol of the sort of visual art language or the way we think about materials in the context of um, categorizations. But mm. but if you also think about it in another way, where he's sort of um, the language itself is something that he's modifying, that he's that he's uh, changing and transforming or trying to um, enact, perform some sort of transformation upon uh, and to sort of reinvent it and give it some new life and that you know is the kind of also a fundamental way of thinking about how certain materials are transformed in in art uh, practices so mm. that's where that came from that was a the, long answer sorry that was a really long answer <laughs> uh, i just wanted yes or no <laughs> um no th th but that's the very last point is interesting because um of the picture theory of language which was put forth by uh uh, Wittgenstein, he said that um, that n a statement, so any verbal statement, anything you say or think, uh, is only meaningful if it can be 
pictured or defined like within the real world. So in that sense, that's why Xu Bing has to use the wood blocks. He has mm -hmm. to bring the material into the into the artwork. Um, and I'll just say as a side note, like one of so one of the I it, unintentional. Uh, funniest and I think some one of the best sort of <laughs> yeah, unintended conceptual art, art conceptual art pieces I've seen is when I've bought a pirated uh, movie and the wrong subtitle. So like um, subtitles from another movie is put onto you know like two movies are combined. One has the subtitles of and you know that that you just end up with these amazing juxtapositions of language. And I've watched some for a while and thought it was the same. I thought it was the right was movie, the right you know, movie. and then yeah. realized partway through. Um, I was just thinking about that when I think of your work as like because you're choosing the frame of a film as much based upon the text that's there as much as the image, right? So. You know that that sort of combination, how those things come together at that moment, right. um, and then sometimes they're completely mismatched. Not only the meaning is different in the English and the Chinese, but sometimes the whole you know the whole meaning of the film is a totally different film transposed upon. Yeah, I yeah. have a I, I just happen to have a friend who recently completed. He's not an artist. He's a complete amateur. He just has a lot of free time. Um, <laughs> That's the artist. Uh, yeah, he's. <laughs> I didn't mean to insult anybody. Um, <laughs> But uh, he 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 bought a DVD uh, and it was I think it was um, a might have been Kurosawa, but it was certainly a black and white Japanese film from the 50s. And he spent one week watching it over and over and rewriting the subtitles, turned the sound off, and he turned he successfully turned this entire film into a, a Russian science fiction movie set in the year 2572 about a village um, and so on and so forth. And that's a, that's a good example of when the language becomes the primary mm -hmm. medium? Material. Material yeah. of, the, uh, of, of this know. artwork, amateur artwork. Um, so I'm, I'm also curious um, why you never thought to change the subtitles on these canvases? Um. If you just check, I would. I if would you totally just check um, any, uh, like Facebook, yeah, that uh, I just saw that um, you can play a game that you you can have any subtitle with the face of uh, Lincoln or whatever, and uh, become a pope from him. But uh, obviously, it's not. But I think you, you, when, now when you open Facebook, you you got thousands of things like that. But. Um, um, for me, I didn't change the subtitle. It's because um, you can really find the exact wording, exact subtitle from the DVD, and uh, um, and then you, you you can see there are quite a lot of layers when you uh, try to interpret my work, or even mm. uh, when you watch the movie again. Then mm. after you read my my after you watch my my painting, then when when you uh, watch the the DVD again, then you recall my painting, and then you have a, a uh, totally okay. different uh, interpretation of. Uh, and with the Zhang Ailing, uh, free the, yeah. the that one, then you can if you've read the novel, mm. then you can. So you're connecting time and space uh, together. Well, uh, with this after one you word. you read um, uh, the um, uh, Da Vinci Code. The Vinci then Code. When you arrive at Milan, what, uh, seeing the Last Supper, then you have totally a different sure. perspective. Sure, yeah. sure. Language is, uh, is, is, is the root of me all memory, right? <laughs> um, but l as language is power, that's one, that's one reason why I'm so curious, how you can hold yourself back from not re-controlling the, the, the... Not only the, the subtitle, sometimes uh, I, I try to... I really have... Uh, so eager to add one more uh, character next to the... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great restraint uh, to not stop, do so. I stop myself just to, to be a machine, reproduce the whole thing exactly from the same, uh, the same from the movie. Thank you for discussing your <laughs> artwork at such length. Um, now I want to talk about uh, Xu Tan's work. Um, Xu Tan is quite well known. Uh, especially in China, but also abroad. He's been practicing for since the late 80s, I think. Uh, is that correct? Uh, with the big tail elephant? Uh, 90s. 90s. Yeah. 90s. Yeah. Um, and his work uh, has 
for the past, when was the first keywords? Uh, 2005. 2005. So oh. for the past 10 years at least, I think very few people associate his work with anything other than, uh, than language, and you'll see why here. Um, his project uh, called Keywords, the Dictionary of Keywords, as he just said, it was in 2005. Um, and w I think it's a research-based project um, which discusses keywords. And maybe you can first introduce, first introduce this series, which you've done in many places, right? Yeah. Uh, my, my English is very limited, so I would like to speak in, in Chinese. That's fine. Uh, for me, language and uh, visuality are one and the same. It has to be uh, because it is like for the overall um, the cognitive uh, activities of man. We really cannot divide these two from one another. We have to use them in conjunction with each other uh, in order for them to reach a uh, actually a sort of a stronger expressivity. In addition to expressivity, uh, contemporary art employs language and uh, let's say language, it's extremely crucial part of contemporary art. For me, art is not only an aesthetic expression, it's also about how you uh, understand the event, how do you research the world. In order to do that, uh, language and concepts are extremely crucial. And the thing he was, uh, started in 2005 and it lasted for about nine years. So when you look at the dictionary of keywords, uh, this phase uh, lasted about three years and I think I called it search for keywords. So uh, from our own life experience, from our conversations with other people, from investigations, uh, from different talk, sort of chats with different people. Uh, when it came out, um, and uh, I have in China and in outside China, both at home and abroad, um, with the different kinds of people, uh, people, for example, very vibrant places like Guangdong, like Shanghai in China, and all the contemporary artists in China. I've done my investi investigation. I, I done a lot of conducted a lot of searches and I think it's kind of a social a social uh, linguistic kind of research. So um, um, towards the 2008, I set up a school of keywords. So there's always going to be a fixed venue where you can have linguistic exchange with people. You can come over and we can have exchanges and, and, and uh, the keywords we think are important in our society in our opinion. So these pictures, um, I, was invest I was interviewing or exchanging my opinions with those workers, factory workers in Qingdao in Shandong province. For a very long period of time, after a long period of research, I, we picked out all these keywords and we returned to the factory and talked to these factory workers. And through their search, I um, I found the exact expression of these words, and you could see that uh, um, the most important thing is that um, which values are, are, are which which values matter to these people in the factory in Qingdao. I asked them to use different colors to choose the key words, and a lot of them use the color red for the word parents. And the bigger the diameter, I think there are more people considering uh, it's a crucial word, uh, vice versa. But um, all these words, um, since the first investigation, you can see that parents 
and feature prominently in the life of factory workers. I can, I've, I've talked to a curator from the West. I said that parents feature very prominently in, uh, in, in the life of Chinese people. And he said, wow, it's very incredible. I can't really imagine why um, in Chinese people's lives par the word parents uh, have carried such heavy weight and people use the color red. And you have to explain um, why you use the word, uh, use the color red. And the overall majority consider that red means passionate enthusiastic and love about love and a few of them think uh, uh, there's sort of an al quality of alarm alarming quality to the color red so you could see also um, parents for not to, uh, not not only really signify love but also uh, alarm warning to the younger generation so I mean visually linguistically uh, these few things combine to to express uh, certain meanings significant for example, that I will just continue with red. When I was in Qingdao, uh, almost nobody associated the color red with Chinese revolution. Nobody. Uh, there was no single person that associated uh, the color red with Chinese revolution uh, in Qingdao. What did they say then? So I was kind of guessing that actually the Chinese was they were trying to forget revolution. They want to put it behind them. And that's how I was talking to Shamu and then in, in Hong Kong with the about the concept of uh, freedom. I also have a, um, in 2007, I talked to about uh, 20 contemporary artists like Ai Weiwei and Cao Fei, and I interviewed them about uh, uh, the keywords, and I was kind of predicting that they would talk about freedom. Uh, but when, when I came back with the material, it's about like 30, over 30 hours of interview, and we, there was only once that the word freedom surfaced. It was like around 20 artists, and only there was once that the word, um, uh, the word, uh, the word uh, freedom surfaced. Yes. But in, uh, in last year in China, when I was investigating um, rural China, I mean, actually, uh, the, the farmers were very, very much concerned about freedom. They've been talking about freedom a lot. And there were about over 20 times that they mentioned the word freedom. Why did contemporary Chinese were quite averse to it, whereas the farmers were so preoccupied with this word? So. Uh, perhaps one, art, uh, one one farmer said he looked he, he he was staring at a forest in the mountain. He left the. Uh, um, this has to do with uh, visuality, because um, if this comes into sort of a weather that is kind of shrouded in um, uh, smog. I mean, he's extremely, he's going to be upset by it. So visuality and uh, language. In my in my uh, catalog, I tried to 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 um, express a kind of a symbiosis, symbiotic relationship between the two. In the third phase of the keyword project, it's all about, um, I call them, um, the uh, keyword lab. So this is about um, culinary. This this happens in Amsterdam. Utrecht. It's about food. Um, sort of a, a keyword lab that takes pla took place in Utrecht in, uh, in Holland. In Cantonese, it means a walk to go. It's a kind of very um, famous kind of restaurant, like takeaway Chinese takeaway restaurant. So um, for me, it is a crucial phase because I not only have to search for keywords, but also have to, uh, about society in general, also want to discover the sort of words of uh, our each individuals. And for me, that was the last couple of years, and it's a sort of a phase of creating keywords when you actually start to uh, conduct research in, with language and you start to create new words to express how you uh, your views on the world and your own research for example in the last um, two years um, there was one word that meant um, social social plants or social bo uh, bo botany 
these this is sort of after sort of a study of the sort of a, the fauna and flora of um, of the uh, Pearl River Delta area, and we kind of invented this word. And to this year, we also discovered another word. It's called animalistic freedom. Uh, we, we can actually, because we 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 we've, we've realized that actually the. the um, the Chinese farmers were very preoccupied with the word freedom. So there are different kinds of freedoms. There are distinctions um, in a different contexts and different. Um, what do they mean? Um, what kind of context do they? Uh, should we locate them? So I'm just giving examples um, about my recent work. Especially, and the picture I showed you, um, the farmers talk about um, endure, and they talk about the relationship between freedom and endure. And so there is actually a, a freedom to endure. So I have to ask the question, the word uh, endure, the freedom to endure. So I think it is a lot of complicated meaning. So it's probably a linguistic uh, significance. First, the word endure is to like achieve freedom. Uh, there is one way you can earn your freedom through enduring things. Or suffering or enduring is already a kind of freedom. So that's a kind of... Uh, so and in Cantonese, the word uh, endure, and actually it's quite different from the Cantonese, uh, the Chinese. I think it's uh, Mandarin. I think it's actually more positive as a term. We are kind of lost. Woman, to Anthony, can, Anthony, can you explain what's going on? I uh, just uh, I think actually the Cantonese uh, endure is more is more uh, positive. So what we Chinese actually think uh, a lot of um, Chinese people say uh, you can in suffer after years of uh, uh, as 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 a daughter-in-law to become a powerful uh, mother-in-law. There's another word which is a set. And a word that we discovered recently, it's very difficult to say it in Mandarin Chinese. We don't know that word in Mandarin Chinese. Say in Cantonese. Is uh, special. I think that using words and using visual medium, we are no longer doing conceptual art because uh, when we are doing conceptual art, then uh, the meaning of uh, language in art and how words can be used as a medium to research and uh, express your feelings towards the world has actually transcended conceptual art. Without uh, the integration of language and visual art, it's impossible for me to carry on the creation of a lot of my works. Noticed in your research uh, at Asia Art Archive, have you noticed any uh, tendencies to unite as he has visual and verbal together? Uh, I think uh, Xu Tan's uh, keyword school is one of the most obvious or one of the most outstanding effort in this perspective, but uh, it's obvious that very, it's, it's a long time project. It's last for the five years already. This project is very unique in the sense that it has different stages. And during different stages, language plays different types of roles in, in the projects. For example, in the beginning, when he did the interviews project in Qingdao, yeah. this is very obvious, like a uh, preparation of the kind of social research as a methodology. And uh, 
in a way, it is not really about language, but about value judgment through the language, looking for the what's important and what's less important in general Chinese people mind through studying the languages that they use. So language is not the goal, but only the mean in this sense. But at the end, like talking about the either or things like that, it's more about directly, directly about the language, if you know what I mean. It's directly it's a little bit like a comparative studies of dialects and Mandarin and the national language. And the pressure in it is very much about literature. If we refer to maybe the Russian formalism, things like Woman Tchaikovsky, like sure. organized violation of uh, everyday language, kind of concept. Organized violation of everyday language. Yes, <laughs> Woman Tchaikovsky. And uh, this, is, this is also very, this is about, I've, I find immediate pressure in it because he is comparing Cantonese and Mandarin, mm. and I'm a, I'm a Cantonese speaker. Similar to Fai's project is, uh, uh, I I don't know. You you said it's very it's very funny to you, but uh, for me, it's projects like this always have a subversive pleasure subversive. in it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Most comedy is subversive. It's yeah, the most effective way to critique. Exactly. So uh, that's why I say the uniqueness of <laughs> Shitan's QX project is very complex that it's uh, actually the focus of it changed all the time and it's developed different trajectories from time to time. Yeah. It's also, a, a, I don't think you mentioned, it's also a, a very uh, efficient way of looking at how society has changed, yeah. these societies. And I think he's worked with other languages and in other, Venice, Sweden also, or with Swedish language as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, unfortunately, I think we're run, we've run out of time. Mm -hmm. um, so. If you have questions, maybe we can talk after. Um, I should have expected that two artists who work so much with language would talk so much. Um, and I should have done a better job of controlling, so I apologize. But if you have questions, we can talk after. Um, in the meantime, thank you, all of you, for coming up here with us today. And thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed.